In this week's episode, I'm joined by Rhonda Payne, CEO and founder of Flock Theory. We'll chat about same-sex rights in South Korea, Home Depot spending $1 billion to raise hourly employee wages, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Let's get started. Rhonda, will you please introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Bernadette. I'm a huge fan of your show, as I think you already know. And I really just want to thank you so much for inviting me to join you and and be in conversation with your community this week. It's it's really an honor. Um, I am Rhonda Payne, as Bernadette said. Hey, everyone. I am a lot of things. You know, there's something I learned as a child that I've been working on unlearning ever since, and that's that you needed to be one thing when you grew up right? Like, what are you going to be? Like, insert answer here. Sure. (laughs) Right. But I'm, I'm a lot of things, right? I'm an educator at heart. True and true. I just bleed education. Um, I'm a speaker agent. I'm an equity strategist, consultant. And I like to think of myself as an innovator. Uh, And sometimes that shows up as entrepreneurship. Sometimes it just shows up as a great thought partner to ideate about all the things. But for nearly three decades, I have spent my time inside of nonprofit membership organizations, supporting best in class trade and professionals associations. Um, I've been a learning leader, workforce equity champion, and uh, advocate for all things learning, growth, equity, and people. I just love those spaces where people and systems and opportunity connect. Me too. And thank you so much for that awesome introduction and for saying kind words about the show. I'm a really big fan of yours as well. And when we chatted, I think it was in December, I just really liked your energy and really liked what you had to say. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of hope you're finding from being an equity strategist? What are some of the things that are just getting you excited and hopeful? Um, absolutely. Thank you. You know, and I, and it's one of the things that's so great about, uh, what you do, Bernadette is focusing on the positive because of course there's so much, uh, work to be done in, in the DEI space. Uh, basically everywhere we look, it feels like we've not made enough progress. And as a practitioner, I know I'm not alone in sometimes feeling burnout. And so this focus on the positive is is just really awesome. And, you know, one of the things I think that has really resonated with me in, in leading Flock Theory, which I've been doing for the past two and a half years, is just how inspiring it is, how hopeful it is to see so many people even having this kind of conversation. I've been kind of in the work, walk in the talk for a couple decades, uh, following parents who were activists, uh, advancing equity. And I can tell you, it just never ceases to fill my bucket to see so many people even willing to have conversations about equity in the spaces that they occupy. Yeah, I agree. And I'm glad you said that because it actually kind of jives with this experience I had last week when I was interviewing a client, uh, one a, a director at a client organization. Um, and he was a, a straight white man. And one of the things that he said to me that really stood out was, I'm going to quote him, when you're a straight white college educated guy in America, you're a square peg in a square hole. How I identify isn't something I have to think about too often, and that's a luxury. 
Doesn't mean I haven't had to overcome challenges, but I try to create an environment where people of all different backgrounds and life experiences can be successful. So I'm not putting the onus on the individual to ask for what they need to be successful. And I was just really shocked by that because he really is very aware of his privilege, of his power and his ability to create equity. I mean, he knows what is in his sphere of influence and sphere of control. And I, I just was so hopeful by that. So I would imagine that's exactly what you're or similar to what you're talking about. That's exactly right. You know, uh, at Block Theory, we like to help organizations and really organization leaders like this gentleman who shared that reflection with you. Uh, We like to help people make good choices, right? We want to help them know better so they can do better. And we want to help them make great choices related to equity in expertise throughout their business. And so for us, that means belonging for communities everywhere expertise shows up. So that sometimes is a stage, sometimes that's a boardroom, sometimes that's a bookshelf, and lots of other places in between. And 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 it's so important that we remind ourselves and everyone we talk to that this is about human connection, right? And it and that means all of us that this is not the work of just you know me, black woman, or you know anybody else who might have a a marginalized aspect of their identity in in American society, right? It's really about how focusing on equity, systems of advantage and disadvantage, are helpful and beneficial to all of us. Absolutely. And and I love what you said about human connection because it really is as simple as that. <laughs> I mean, <Right. laughs> it is about our common humanity and, and awareness of our various different lived experiences and how that impacts our outcomes and and just wanting to be kind. I, I really do think it's as simple as that. I've been reading a bunch of stuff about spirituality lately. So, you know, it's all kind of connected to me. It is that, you know, and I think it's also, it's that plus this one step forward, which means that as we seek and naturally are connected to one another in this world, there are things that might just be out of view, right? Things that we might believe are true or we're taught were true or just that we've just been around a lot, so they're normalized. And just taking that opportunity to examine why that's happening, to discover that it's happening at all, right? Mm -hmm. Examine why and interrupt some of these things. Um, Some of them are, you know, personal things, personal biases that we can be aware of and interrupt. But sometimes it's bigger than that, right? And so I love um, the idea of also focusing this work on the institutions and systems, Mm -hmm. right? Those processes and policies that can have a kind of outsized impact. It's still all in the service of of awesome human connection, Mm -hmm. right? But but sometimes we do need some help. Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think best case scenario is any DEI initiative has to really combine a holistic, strategic systems and process change and evolution plus behavior change. They really have to go hand in hand um, because, you know, I, I'm passionate about learning and development as well, but we know that that's only going to move the needle so far. That's right. That's right. And we know that half of those things that are kind of under that umbrella of learning and development, which I can say, having spent my life doing learning and development, doesn't stick, right? We have to remember to focus on what makes good learning in the first place what changes behavior through learning uh, and what doesn't because so many of the things falling under DEI and learning interventions just are in one ear and out the other. I feel like you've uh, been like (laughs) spying on my most recent keynote. It's, it's exactly about this. I think you're exactly right. Okay. Well, that's a conversation for another day. Let's get to, to, (laughs) no, we can talk. We can talk. I know it. Um, All right. So let's get to this week's good vibes. Uh, The the first story comes from South Korea. The South Korean high court ruled that same-sex couples in the country are entitled to the same national health benefits as their opposite sex 
counterparts. So in Asia, only one country allows same-sex marriage, and there really are not a lot, a lot of openly LGBTQ people, and certainly no laws to protect them, or very few. So really big deal out of South Korea. Absolutely, it is. It's huge. It's, it's huge news. But I don't know. My feelings are a little mixed on it because, of course, it's good news. Any progress feels like good news. But with so much um, ground that really needs to be addressed, so many issues, I kind of wonder, do you think it's enough? Right. Like, and I know it's kind of rhetorical. I'm like, nah, Brennan, that's not the good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of already know. But you know what I mean? Like, it is good, but I kind of always I have a little hesitant sometimes in celebrating, celebrating the good when I know it's stopping short of what centers the humanity of people. <laughs> you know what? I agree. I absolutely agree. And I think that it's um you know, up until a few months ago here in the U.S., we didn't have protections <laughs> on the basis yeah, right. of sexual orientation and gender identity nationally, federally. So it's not enough. And and so absolutely, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, but what I think this does offer is gives folks a little bit more freedom to be openly out. And that starts to change hearts and minds that starts to build allies and that starts to ultimately affect policy. So <laughs> it's the door is cracking a little bit open. That's right. And you know what I, what I think of right away is, Ooh, I wonder what supports are needed, right? Because sometimes it's kind of like in the U S where, you know, say a company will institute some new initiative and maybe they hire a bunch of people with identities that they didn't have in their company before. And so the floodgate kind of opens and the numbers change really quick. Right. But without inclusion, without support systems around people, it can actually harm more people. So it's it's one of those kind of it can be a one step forward, two steps back if the right supports aren't there. And I worry that people will be invited to identify and take advantage only to be penalized later. And so my reaction is, uh oh, what do we need to do to like rally around and make sure that there's more to it than just this piece of legislation? So it's a yes and situation. All of these things always are. <laughs> and so <laughs> let's move on to the next yeah, story. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the next story comes from Barbie from Mattel. So Emmy Award winning costume designer and Beyonce's former stylist, Zarina Akers, partnered with Barbie to create a collection of dolls that are icons of black culture. It's part of a Black History Month collection, and they reflect the diversity of hairstyles, skin tones, and uh, hair textures, styles. Pretty cool. It is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And, and, and without a doubt, Barbie, talk about icons, Barbie is an icon. I don't know about icons of Black culture, but I know that Barbie <laughs> is an icon, right? <laughs> And, and, and it is awesome. You know, I am a mother of two, I have two kids, Blair and Mia, they are 20 years apart. So I've had this unique opportunity to um, experience, you know, talk about lived experience, right? My lived experience raising two black kids 20 years apart is that the toy game has just changed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from store aisles that used to just like, like vomit pink everywhere in one aisle and be like amazing bright colors in another to what those toys are to to how they're marketed and all of that all the merchandising and everything and so it's it's changed a lot and we know that toys are one of the earliest ways outside of like our family and caregivers that we can foster inclusion through representation for kids helping them see themselves is a really big deal not only just in other kids that, you know, or, or toys that depict other kids, but also in, you know, that Barbie, that's a doctor or that Barbie, you know, mm -hmm. all, all the things. And so I'm excited to see it. I am, um, I feel kind of the same way about this one that I do about Disney's collaboration with creative soul photography. So these are two doll collections that came out in black history month um, with big platforms partnering with black creatives on the other side. And, and it's, it's, 
my, my reaction is this, it's complicated, but I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always complicated. It really is. Um, but I, you know, I think that you're right. Representation really does go so far. And, you know, Barbie, I think I had Barbie on the show a few weeks ago as well, because there's a Barbie with scoliosis. So there's really, there's kind of starting to be a Barbie for everyone, which, you know, I think it really does matter to these kids. It does, you know, and Mattel, you know, who makes Barbie for those who don't know, hasn't had that great of a track record. If you look to the whole, the organization's whole history and the whole history of the Barbie brand, right? But but what it does have, what I do like and what works, right, that we want to focus on is they have iterated, right? Experimentation and iteration is something that I see in the Barbie brand that we want to just keep seeing more of, right? Here, they, like in 2021, I remember the story where they came up with another doll collection for the Tokyo Olympics, and they came under some justifiable fire, right? They were held to account publicly because this, you know, collection of dolls, A, did not have a single doll that appeared to be Japanese or any Asian uh, identity for that matter. And so that was a real kind of aha for them, learning sure. moment, right? And also that collection featured 100% long straight hair, including the black doll. So if you go wow. from 2021 to 2023, that's a, that's a leap forward for them to have dolls centered with texturized hair that might be in styles that are racially and ethically appropriate for the doll that they're depicting. Absolutely. And I think that that's where the partnerships with diverse creators comes into play is to have those perspectives, right? That's right. And the next step is, hey, don't do it just during Black History Month as That's a special, right. <laughs> but normalize it as how you work all the time. And they do that by having those same identities in their workforce. Absolutely. All right. The third story is about Home Depot, which became the latest company with a major frontline workforce to increase its minimum wage to at least $15 an hour. And this means that they're spending more than a billion dollars, $1 billion on these raises and these raises affect employees in the supply chain, customer service, merchandising, and similar. So a lot of BIPOC folks in those roles. So this directly impacts them. Absolutely. You know, it's hard to hear of a company contributing an extra billion dollars compared to what they did before to pay their team and not think that's an amazing thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really great. Um, I do think that this is also, we know that might be the theme for today. It's also <laughs> like a end, right? Because while it's awesome and an excellent people policy in general, and I want to see more of that, I want people to follow what they're doing and do more of it. I also want us to keep asking, why is it still true that Black and Brown people disproportionately benefit? Because that's the part for me as a Black woman that has a sting to it, mm -hmm. right? Like, I know that this is part of their 2020 pledge, right? We all know about the 2020 pledges to create environments where their people are included and valued. But they also had two other parts of that pledge, which were inclusive representation at all levels of the company and including hiring, training and advancement opportunities. So in the future, what I hope for them is that they will build on this really great change with other great changes that mean that all people of all racial identities benefit equally because they've got representation at all levels of the company. Yeah, I agree. They did promote 65,000 folks internally last year as well. But I'm sure that those folks did not get promoted to executive levels. I mean, for the most part, right? Because that's really, that's where the huge gap really is. That's right. Okay. Next story is about how Seattle became the first U.S. city to ban caste discrimination by adding it as a protected class to the city's anti-discrimination ordinance. I love policy changes like this. Yes. <laughs> So do I, right? Because it gets at the system, 
right? right. And, and there's just this outsized impact we can have when we get at the system. So policies are where to focus if we want to make change and make it quickly, which we do. You know, I so appreciated you putting this news on my radar. I hadn't seen it before you shared it with me and took a little look. And, and, it's, and it's awesome, right? What I learned by looking at the research, which is one of the things, you know, at Flock Theory we do, we, all of our work is rooted in, in, in the you know, empirical data and, and, and research uh, to contextualize the strategy. And when I looked at research around South Asian people and experiences of discrimination in the U.S., Pew did, you know, did a survey as they do, they found that it was about 20 percent of the population of South Asian people who are working in America who said that they experienced discrimination based on their caste identity um, as an immigrant. Um, and so oh. that's, you know, it's not as big as some data, right? But 20% isn't nothing. Yeah, it's so a lot. Yeah. I'm thrilled to see it. But I think it's a win, you know, it's a win for DEI for sure. It's a win for immigrants, frankly, as well, because there are aspects of DEI that are different in other parts of the world. And because America is so richly filled with immigrants, we sometimes bring some of those contexts into America and it blends in with ours in both good and bad ways. And so I think it's a, a win for immigrants too. And, and really every American, like we talked about before. But when we think about how many of the racialized inequities in America might also be explained through the lens of a cast. It's also <laughs> extra special for me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of Isabel Wilkerson and her book called Cast mm -hmm. argues that racial tensions in the U.S. are best explained by a caste system. And she kind of talks about these eight different tenets of a caste system and explains how those are playing out. And, and a lot of what she learned, she learned from studying caste in South Asia. And so I think it's, there are things that we can learn from this policy that also impact the DEI landscape beyond protections for South Asians alone. I absolutely agree. I think that this is really kind of a, a wake up call for a lot of folks. And hopefully it's something that other cities, especially those with a huge South Asian population like Seattle, really start to consider and to start to look at how this can impact other traditionally marginalized groups. Absolutely. I was just going to say one of the other things that's really great about it is how no one set of DEI initiatives is right across the board in every place, in every company, in every city. And what's really great is how focused, how they use the data of their own uh, locale, their own destination in, in determining what made sense to focus on, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Focusing on cast in other parts of the country may not be the first priority. It's still good. It's still good to do. And I'm like, yes, everyone should adopt it. But, it, you know, it's important. And I think a great illustration for people thinking about their own walk to think about contextualizing it for your particular use case and what you want to focus on. Absolutely. And I think that's really the case with a lot of these uh, five thing stories is, you know, there are some really random things I talk about on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some of them just might not fit uh, for a lot of organizations, but they are still things to celebrate and be inspired by. That's and right. he here's another one. And then the last story from today is about Amazon. So Amazon uh, has made it easier for folks with hearing loss, especially those with cochlear implants, to watch TV shows and movies. So because Amazon Instant Video now has an option to add to have Bluetooth connect directly, the TV sound directly, to the cochlear implant. So it means that folks who use them can have a better sound quality without a kind of an expensive adapter they would otherwise have to buy. So first streaming company to do this, these are the types of things that I personally don't ever have to think about because of my privilege. Absolutely. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> like <laughs> this one I love so much, so, so much, right? It's that example of a, uh, you know, moving beyond personal and interpersonal work to like a systemic change. It's a, it's a lesson in inclusive product design and iterating on one's product to make it more and more inclusive by small or 
we're not so small changes we can make to it. And I am out here rooting for them. I am hoping that every single part of the competition takes note and copies them quickly as the competition will do, or even tries to one up them in terms of how inclusive your streaming platform can be. They got the challenge here on five things. (laughs) That's right, Rhonda. And if they do, or when they do, I shall say, you can read about it or listen to it on five things and five things in 15 minutes. So you absolutely, they threw down the gauntlet and, you know, I don't actually talk about Amazon much on this show. So there they go. They get, they get a win. I don't talk about home Depot much on this show either. So a couple of, a couple of wins today. Well, that's it. Right. And I think, you know, you mentioned that you don't talk about some of these companies much and I don't either. I don't, I do not find myself talking about some of these companies in terms of, of wins because we know, right. That there are a lot of other things that they're still earlier in their journey on, right. To be gentle, (laughs) (laughs) but I mean, it is important to recognize without over grandizing, uh, you know, the success, it's important that, you know, to acknowledge the wins as we're making them. Absolutely. Well, that is it for today. I want to uh, add a call to action to this show, which is going to be a new feature going forward. So the call to action for folks watching or listening, know about the, what is going on, uh, attacking LGBTQ rights in the U.S. The state of Tennessee is about to ban drag queens, drag performances. So there's a lot of anti-LGBTQ stuff happening. Pay attention. Pay attention. All right. So Rhonda, that's the call to action for today. Can you tell folks another call to action, how to find you? How can they connect with you? Oh, I'd love to. So um, please uh, reach out and connect on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter even. Um, I'm out there in all the places. And so is Flock Theory. You can find me personally um, with the handle my 19 cents, because I always, as you can tell from this podcast, have more than just two cents <laughs> to share. Um, and you can find Flock Theory at Planet Flock. We're also at flocktheory.com. Reach out anytime, schedule a meeting, let's talk. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a a great guest. I love the energy. And for folks who are watching or listening for the first time, you can subscribe to the Five Things newsletter at fivethingsdei.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI 